Introduction to Abortion and Marquis's Why Abortion is Immoral. Warning, philosophy ahead. Abortion is a sensitive, intimate topic with high stakes. The moral status of abortion, however, is a lot more difficult than people tend to think it is. So as philosophers, we cannot ignore it. We must confront it. Remember that progress is made in everything, including philosophy, by confronting challenges, not fleeing them. Our goal is not to figure out whether abortion is moral or not. Rather, we want to come to better, more reasoned positions on the issue. We want to look at some models of interesting and high-quality philosophy, which we see in Marquis's paper and in Judith Jarvis Thompson's A Defense of Abortion. We also want to get practice at confronting emotionally and politically laden topics reasonably. What is an abortion? Of course, most women have some spontaneous abortions that they never know about. Oftentimes, this is because there's a sort of genetic deformity in the embryo. Um, but that's not what we're going to mean by abortion. Henceforth, we'll mean the word abortion to refer to deliberate abortions. Uh, that is to say, when you kill and remove an embryo or a fetus. This is a slideshow of fetal development. It is a pro-life slideshow. It is accurate, um, but of course they put in, you know, there's some emotionally moving music and so forth that, um, you know, may bias the viewer in favor of a pro-life position. We could ignore that. Okay, I will stop it here. Uh, ba basically, at this point, we just have more of the same. Um, it, it just grows in size. Okay, we're also going to look at this Guttmacher Institute research on abortion. Guttmacher Institute is a pro-choice friendly uh, institute. I will use the terms pro-choice and pro-life in this discussion, by the way. And they show how there are fewer and fewer abortions being done in America, uh, having peaked in, say, the early 80s or late 70s. Why is this the case? Well, mostly better contraceptive use and probably the availability of Plan B is contributing mightily. Um, now, that throws 
a wrench in our discussion because some people consider plan B to be an abortifacient. It is not considered by the medical community to be an abortifacient because for whatever reason, the medical community considers an abortion um, as something that can be done only after implantation. Uh, a lot of critics of abortion uh, don't see implantation as morally relevant to whether or not an abortion was performed. If you make a woman's womb and you know a hostile place for a and if for implantation to occur, then um, you're making it impossible for that uh, fertilized egg to develop and so forth. So what is the difference metaphysically whether or not implantation has occurred or not? I have to confess, I don't understand that either. Uh, it doesn't seem that important to me. Uh, if, if you think, yeah, of course it doesn't decide the issue. I'm just saying that if you think plan B is itself an abortifacient, then this curve uh, is, uh, would look a lot different because I, a lot of people are using plan B. All right, so I'm just going to, so how many people are having abortions? Well, about 800 to 900,000 are performed a year in the United States at this stage. Who has abortions? Uh, some things to point out. Uh, they, they, Guttmacher Institute says about one in four women will have an abortion by 45. Most of them are in their 20s. Right, so a third are college age or just out of college age women and another almost third uh, before 30. So in your 20s, basically 60% of all the abortions are from women in their 20s. Not that many are adolescents. Um, whites uh, have about 40% of the abortions. Blacks about 30%. So blacks are somewhat overrepresented, although I don't know if you, whites are older than blacks in America. So I don't, you know, I don't really know how, how overrepresented blacks are. This is a very interesting stat to me. Almost 60% of abortions in 2014 were, were obtained by patients who had at least one birth. 75% of abortion patients were poor, having an, which is defined as having an income below the federal poverty level of 16,000 for a family of two or low income. In 2014, over half or about half of abortion patients were using a contraceptive method in the month they became pregnant, most commonly condoms. So that's, uh, that's a very, those are very interesting stats. Okay, returning to our slideshow, how are abortions performed? You have medical abortions, which use something like an abortion pill um, some sort, you, you, you take something that um, baby basically sloughs off the lining of the uterus and takes the embryo with it. According to the last time I updated these notes, about 40% of first trimester abortions are done this way, usually be before 10 weeks. Uh, then you have surgical abortions in which the embryo or fetus uh, is vacuumed out. And when I updated these notes last, uh, this was the most common form in the U.S. and can be done only up to 15 weeks of gestation. Midterm abortions and, and late-term abortions require some sort of dilation of the cervix where the fetus is scraped out or vacuumed out. Things get more complicated with uh, late-term abortions. Um, there are late-term abortions a few thousand a year. Um, it used to be performed by um, basically causing a breech birth. So the cervix is dilated and then the, the doctor uses forceps to pull out the legs and butt and torso of the fetus, leaving the head just inside the woman and then uh, inserting scissors into the back of the head, scrambling the fetus's brains vacuuming out the fetus's brains, then the head collapse 
head collapses and is pulled out of the vagina. Now, this was made illegal in 2003 by the Partial Birth Abortion Ban Act, and that was that banning was upheld by the Supreme Court in 2007, although it is permitted if for some reason it is felt in the to be uh, medically necessary. The law um, has, there are other ways to have third trimester abortions or late term abortions, um, which is just that the, the fetus is basically poisoned through a syringe and killed inside the womb and then um, delivered. It is worth noting how divided the country is about abortion. Um, you could look at the Gallup links that I provide in my notes. We see that if, if you break it down by gender, when it comes to the morality of abortion, uh, the question is um, whether you personally believe it is morally acceptable or morally wrong. All right. So they're, they're saying regardless of whether you think it's legal, just what do you think about the morality? And when they ask Americans that about half of men think it's morally wrong, but about half of men think it's morally acceptable. About half of women think it's morally wrong. And about 40% of women think it's morally acceptable. So this, is, this may come as a surprise to you. It doesn't come as a surprise to me teaching the abortion debate I find that uh, there are very little differences between men and women's views about the morality of abortion. And if anything, I would say that in my experience teaching this topic, women tend to take, women seem to be um, overrepresented on the extremes on this issue. Obviously there is a conservative liberal divide, um, pretty much flipped. Whereas 71% of conservatives think it's morally wrong, um, only only a quarter of um, only only a quarter about of liberals think it's wrong. Self-described liberals. What about legality? A very recent poll. Again, we see that. Do you think abortion should be legal under any circumstances? Legal only under certain circumstances or legal in all circumstances. That has been asked by Gallup for a long time. Right now, um, about a quarter of men think it should be legal under any circumstances. Almost six, you know, somewhere between 50 and 60% think it should be legal in certain circumstances and only to about 20% think it should be illegal in all circumstances. And again, not that much of a difference between the men and the women. When it comes to the legality of abortion, very little has changed in America over decades, over my whole life. About half of Americans think it should be legal only under certain circumstances. And then you have a hard quarter who say illegal under any circumstance and a hard quarter who think it should be uh, legal under any circumstance. It's worth noting how extreme under any circumstances means. <laughs> okay. I mean, does under any circumstances mean if the woman is going to die, if she doesn't have an abortion, uh, she should, she should die. Well, that's, that would fall under, under, under any circumstances. Um, so it's, it's quite a thing to say that it should be illegal under any circumstances. It's also quite a thing to say it should be uh, legal under any circumstances. You know, should it be legal for a woman who has a perfectly healthy fetus and is due to uh, deliver that fetus, uh, you know, the next day to have an abortion for some trivial reason, um, or just as a sort of art experiment, right? And she wants to, to film a little documentary on it and get lots of attention on YouTube. Um, kind of bizarre, but not beyond the realm of possibility. If you think abortion should be legal, and even those circumstances, that's, that's, that's a pretty hardcore 
view as well. So, um, you know, you could see why 50% of people would, would think it should be legal under some circumstances and illegal under other circumstances. And what's important to see is that about half of the people who consider themselves pro-life are in, are in the group that think it should be legal in some circumstances. And about half of the people who consider themselves pro-choice think it should be illegal in some circumstances. You can see this by how Americans self-identify as being pro-life or pro-choice. Whereas once, you know, in, in, the, in the early 90s, the pro-choice position was much bigger, was much more popular. Nowadays, it's running pretty much neck and neck with those who identify as pro-life. Maybe the pro-life position is recently ascendant. Okay. But as we saw above, right, this is, so this is America split down the middle on whether or not they're calling themselves pro-life or pro-choice. But, ha but half of the people who are calling themselves pro-life and pro-choice agree on this, agree that it should be legal under only certain circumstances. It may be that they think those certain circumstances are different circumstances. Maybe the pro-lifers are way less permissive than the pro-choicers over which circumstances, maybe. Maybe not as much as you think. It may be that um, there's actually a lot more overlap between which cases people think should be legal and illegal. And it may be that a lot of people who agree on a case-by-case -case basis would still identify differently as pro-life or pro-choice because of you know, some larger tribal affiliation um, or some sort of psychological valence uh, for or against abortion, you know, some sort of repugnance of abortion or something like that maybe. To sum up here, I just want to say that um, in my experience teaching, all this is reflected in my students. About half are generally pro-life. About half are generally pro-choice. Um, there's uh, some serious overlap between the pro-choicers and the pro-lifers. I have found that uh, there's not a big gender difference. I am continually surprised at the positions students take. I am often, my, my stereotype about which student is gonna be pro-life and which student is gonna be pro-choice um, is often inaccurate. So I'm telling you all this just so you feel free, at least with me, to take whatever position you want on the issue. It doesn't matter to me. I'm not saying that because it's not an important issue. I think it is an important issue. I'm not saying it doesn't matter to me because it doesn't matter. I'm just saying that as your professor, your position, the position you take doesn't matter to me. Students change their minds all the time about things. I've changed my mind about this issue and changed it back and will probably change it again. I don't, you know, it's a tough issue. Nothing that I say here or that anyone says is going to really change your mind on the issue long term. Um, just just you know, continue to think about it and and develop and and just explore your thoughts on the issue. Okay, let's talk about Marquis's paper on abortion, and that is how you pronounce his name, even though it's kind of Americans would say Marquis. He he pronounces it Marquis. There's going to be some disconnect here between how philosophers debate abortion and what you might hear on TV or on the street. For instance, consider this bad argument uh, for the pro-choice position uh, that says, look, uh, women can do what they want with their body. The fetus is part of a woman's body. So therefore, the woman can do what she wants with a fetus. Um, but that's not the case. The fetus is not part of a woman's body. This can be, I think, shown by this argument. A penis is part of Sally's fetus, Let's say she's pregnant with a boy. If X is part of Y and Y is part of Z, then X is part of Z. So if my fingernail is part of my finger and my finger is part of my body, then my fingernail is part of my body. That's a transitivity of parthood. That's a debatable, debatable principle, but probably the case. Um, so if 
a penis is part of Sally's fetus and the transitivity of parthood is true, then Sally has a penis when she's pregnant with a boy. But Sally, of course, does not have a penis when she is pregnant with a boy. She doesn't have a penis for the you know, eight and a half months that she has a, a male fetus. Um, so my mom, my mom had six kids. She did not go from having 10 fingers to getting pregnant with my oldest sister and having 20 fingers and then giving birth to my oldest sister, going back to 10 fingers and then having uh, 20 fingers again when she got pregnant with the second kid and so forth. That's not happening. Uh, the fetus is not part of a woman's body. There, just because something is inside your body doesn't mean that it's part of your body. Um, there's a, there may be a little poop in your body right now, right? Um, there's a little urine sitting in your body right now. Um, that does not mean that that urine is part of your body just because it is in your body. So, nor, you know, so I'm not, I'm not saying, right? I'm not saying that, that the poop in your body has some sort of profound right to life. And I'm not saying a fetus is um, no more important than, a, than, a, than some poop in, residing inside your intestine. Okay, I'm just making the point that um, poop is not part of your body and thus that just because something is inside your body, um, that does not mean it's part of your body. Here's a bad pro-life argument. It goes, it, 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 it begins with the premise that uh, life starts at conception. Now this is, way too vague for what the pro-lifer needs um, because first of all, not all life is important. A blade of grass is not morally important. You could go out to your backyard right now and just pluck a blade of grass and no one cares and no one should care because although that blade of grass is alive, it's not morally very important at all. Okay, okay, the, the pro-lifer will say that's not what we mean. We mean that it is human life. Okay, but not and, and I grant that. I don't see how we could possibly disagree. Um, surely a fertilized egg, a blastocyst, and an embryo, and so for fetus, surely that's human life. But not all human life is morally important. So you could scratch your finger right now and kill thousands of cells or skin cells. So you're killing a whole lot of human life. Those are human skin cells. You're killing a whole lot of human life. Nonetheless, um, that's just morally fine. There's nothing wrong with just scratching your, your skin vigorously and killing a bunch of your uh, human cells. So human life is not important understood this way. Okay, 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 Dan. We don't mean life. We don't mean human life. We mean that from the moment of conception, the fertilized egg is a human life, a human life, an independent human organism. Stop being such a pedantic hair splitter, Dan. We mean that a human life begins at conception. All right, that's interesting. Uh, things get a lot more interesting once we grant this, but we still have to establish that a human life that is wrong to kill a human life. And that may not be the case. A lot of philosophers are want to distinguish between being a human being and being a person. Okay. So humanity is a biological property as we're talking about it. Okay. That may or may not be had by a person. A person, however, is a non-biological category that may be realized by humans or non-humans. So Star Trek's Spock, for instance, is a Vulcan. He is not a human, but Spock is certainly a person. All right, so you get it that not all persons are humans. You may say, but that's ridiculous, Dan. Spock is a fictional character, right? I get that he's a fictional character, but if he were real, you agree that he would be a person and you would not concede that he was a human. The universe is a big place, folks. And there almost certainly is intelligent life out there. Almost certainly is life way more intelligent than us. And if we met them, they might be very strange to behold indeed. But nonetheless, um, they would be what we consider persons. What 
what that is is tough to say. It has something to do with being rational, autonomous, you know, speaking and communicating and language and so forth. And, and so we would, we would consider them persons, even if they had like tentacles and so forth. But they would, you know, they certainly would not be humans. It's worth noting as well that for those of you who uh, adhere to a Western religion, you believe in God. Uh, m many of you also believe in angels. Uh, and so those are considered by your own faith to be personal beings. So you yourselves already believe that there are some beings that are persons and not humans. Can there be some humans who are not persons? Yes. So consider people who are in a permanent vegetative state. They are still humans, of course, but are they strictly speaking persons? Uh, maybe not. We often say things like, okay, they're brain dead. They're in a vegetative state. That means their metabolic processes are going on, but, they're, but they themselves have, are no more if you think of them in terms of you know, who they were as a person. Okay. So you know, when I was a little bit older than you, there was this huge controversy, controversy over a woman named Terry Shivo who was in a bad car accident and received some serious brain damage. And her boyfriend insisted she was on, she was on basically, she was fed through tubes, but she could breathe on her own. And her boyfriend insisted that she would have wanted to um, be euthanized if she were in this condition, that she had even talked about it with him. Her parents insisted that she not be euthanized, that she, uh, in fact, they felt like she was responding to their conversation with her because she was having, she, she did move around. Her eyes would roll around in her head and so forth. And she'd make, she'd, she even vocalized, if I remember correctly. The doctors performed brain scans and they concluded that there was nothing going on that she, there, there was no conscious experience or were the doctors right? I don't know. Uh, I don't think we can know, but whatever happened, they decided to remove the feeding tubes and, and, and she eventually sort of basically starved to death. So that's a tough case, but take, let's just stipulate a case where there's nothing going on and nothing that's ever going to happen again. This, in this situation, we might say that, you know, there's a human here, of course, but not a person, that the person is gone, okay? So we, we don't have perfect overlap between humans and persons. There can be persons, like God, if God exists, angels, if angels exist, uh, various intelligent space aliens who are persons but not humans, and there are some humans that are not persons. And this is when we have an interesting question, right? Why does this matter to abortion? Because it may be that the fetus, even if the fetus, going back to our argument, even if the fetus is, or even if the, say, the embryo, if, if you don't want to talk about fetuses, even if the embryo is a human life, even if it is a human life, that doesn't settle the question of whether or not it may be uh, permissibly killed. Why? Because maybe all the rights that we have are rights that we have because we are persons, not because we are humans. Right? So if it's just a human and not a person, then it may not have a right to life or a very strong right to life. That all needs to be hashed out. Okay, in your introduction to the abortion debate, I had you read an introduction by uh, Graham Audie and David Boonin, and they set 
things up this way. They call it, they call this the standard pro-life argument. Premise one, a human fetus has the same right to life as an adult human being. And this is where a lot of the debate focuses on the street. But um, there, that doesn't take us, that, that alone doesn't take us to abortion being immoral, even if that's true. You also need a premise like this. If an adult human fetus has the same right to life as an adult human being, then abortion is morally impermissible then you would validly arrive at the conclusion that abortion is morally impermissible. So that's a, this is a valid argument. That doesn't mean it's a sound argument. We're going to look at whether or not it's a sound argument. I don't think um, we, we must absolutely keep in mind that even if this is an unsound argument, that doesn't mean abortion is morally permissible. There may be a different sound argument arriving at the conclusion that uh, abortion is morally impermissible. I will also point out that this argument may be a little stronger than it needs to be. Um, you could have a, a weaker argument that along these lines that gets you to the conclusion that abortion is morally impermissible. So for instance, you could say a human fetus has a pretty strong right to life. Maybe not as strong as an adult human being's right to life, but a, hum a human fetus has a, a pretty strong right to life. And if a human being has, if a human fetus has a, pretty strong right to life, then abortion is morally impermissible. So abortion would be morally impermissible. That would, that would get you a valid argument as well. After all, you know, it, abortion, abortion um, may be really, really wrong if uh, fetuses have the same right to life as you or I do, but merely be pretty wrong if uh, fetuses have a weaker but still f very strong right to life. So um, it doesn't, doesn't need to be this strong. But nonetheless, it's simple. Let's keep it simple and just you know, talk about it having the same right to life as we do. So there's Don Marquis, a picture of Don Marquis, a professor in Kansas, uh, emeritus now. And again, his name is pronounced Marquis. And he's going to focus on this argument that a human fetus has a, a, a strong right to life, okay? And it's worth noting, and I think it is really worth noting, that he doesn't rely upon any sort of religious principles. So a lot of you think like, if you're anti-abortion, it has to be based upon some sort of religious scruple or some exotic metaphysics about uh, a soul or something like that. Um, but Marquis is himself not, he is in atheist, in fact, a pretty strident atheist, or at least was at the time of the writing of this paper. And here is his argument right here. Premise one, it is prima facie seriously wrong to kill anything with a future like ours, which we're going to abbreviate as a flow, a future like ours. We'll talk about what that means in a bit. Premise two, zygotes, embryos, and fetuses have futures like ours. So it's prima facie seriously wrong to kill zygotes, embryos, and fetuses because abortion, he says, deprives the fetus of, quote, all the experiences, activities, projects, and enjoyments that would otherwise have constituted the fetus's future. Okay, so life is good and you are depriving a fetus of all that good by aborting it. Premise four, although sometimes the prima facie wrongness of killing something with a future like ours is outweighed by some greater wrong. Yes, that, that can be said of you and me too. If the Zargons are going to attack earth, if you don't kill your innocent philosophy professor, well, okay, maybe you should still kill your innocent philosophy professor. Um, it, it is that, that the wrongness of, of killing me would be outweighed by the good achieved by saving the earth, maybe, right? So um, that's true of adults. And it could be true of fetuses too, that sometimes you should kill one. But in most circumstances, he says, in most circumstances, that won't be happening. And so in most circumstances, what's going on is just something some grave evil is going on. In most circumstances, abortion is seriously wrong. 
All right, so let's, this is a valid argument. We now need to wonder if it is a sound argument by examining the truth of the premises. Is it, what, what, what does this mean, let alone is it true that it is prima facie seriously wrong to kill anything with, a, with, this, with this construct he, he develops called a future like ours? What is he talking about there? Well, he asks, what makes uh, killing you or me wrong? That's a natural point to begin with. What makes killing one of us wrong? It's uncontroversial that you shouldn't kill an innocent human. What, what makes it wrong to kill you or me? And look, yeah, will my family feel bad if you kill me? Yes. But even if I didn't have a family, it would be wrong to kill me. Even if no one loved me, it would be wrong to kill me. Okay, so it has something to do with me. You're, you're wronging, in a sense, me, not my family, not just my family by killing me. And a very good candidate for why it's wrong to kill me is that you are depriving me. My death deprives me of all the experiences, activities, projects, and enjoyments that would otherwise have constituted my future. I have life ahead of me with lots of fun. I want to see my kids grow up. I want to see them get married. I want them to have grandchildren. There are places I want to travel. There are experiences I want to have. There are friends I want to make. There are friends I have met online that I've never got to meet in person. I'd like to meet some of them in person. Um, so there, there, there are a whole lot of cool things I want to do. And if I just keeled over today, I would miss out on all that. And if you killed me today, you would be depriving me. You'd be robbing me of all that. So in killing a normal person, you're taking a valuable future from them, which he calls a future like ours. And Marquis takes pains to note that robbing somebody of a valuable future is not the only reason why it's wrong to kill them. It matters that you will hurt a lot of people in their lives. And that is another good reason not to kill them. What if somebody has no valuable future? What if they're dying in a hospital bed and they're going to live only another week in pain? Well, you still think it's wrong to kill them. Why? Not because they have a valuable future. Maybe it's something else. Maybe they have a right to life based upon some contractual agreements with society, not, not to aggress on each other whatever it is, okay? Marquis could grant that, no problem. So you can have a very strong right to life even if you don't have a flow. You could have a very strong right to life based upon considerations other than your flow. But having a flow is sufficient. It isn't necessary to having a strong right to life, but it is sufficient for having a strong right to life. Then Marquis turns to some uh, consequences of his view. One consequence that seems to check out is that it's worse to kill, say, a border collie puppy. Border collies, very smart, very smart animals. You know, you take a border collie on a farm, that is a happy, Happy little creature. If you're forced to kill either a border collie puppy or an ant, which would you kill if you were forced to kill one of them? Well, I think all of you would choose to kill the ant. All right. And the reason is, I think you'll agree, is that, well, you just sense that you are, as it were, 
taking less away from the ant by killing it than you are the border collie from killing it. You are depriving the ant of less experience, of less rich life than you are of the border collie. The border collie can have a lot of joy. Do ants ever feel joy? Probably not. Border Collies almost certainly do feel joy, probably levels of joy <laughs> if, they're, if they're on a farm with good parents that, uh, that you and I rarely have maybe, <laughs> okay? So, um, you know, it's, you're, you'd be taking a lot more from this creature than from this creature uh, by killing it. And, and, and so that shows that you care a lot about the future of a being when you decide whether to kill it. And that's what Marcus's view uh, says. His view also says that it doesn't matter whether you're a human or not. Murdering an intelligent extraterrestrial would be as bad as murdering a normal human adult. Why? Well, if because that extraterrestrial has uh, a future like ours, that's what... Uh, that would be sufficient for making it wrong to kill them. Not that they're humans, but that they have a good future. And you might even think that it's worse, much like the ant in the border collie case. You might think it's even worse to kill Spock as a 10-year-old than to kill a human being as a 10-year-old since Vulcans live a lot longer than humans. And Vulcans have maybe even a richer intellectual and emotional life than humans. Maybe, but that's something to think about. Marcus's view also allows us to uh, uh, euthanize people. All right. Allows, I stress, it doesn't require us to euthanize people. But if you think that euthanasia is okay, then um, you might think it's okay because there's no future for that person. Okay. Um, in which, or it, it, you know, so if you're dying of, if you think somebody dying of cancer and who has only a few months of misery ahead of them has a moral right to kill themselves on the grounds that they have, uh, they don't have a, a good future ahead of them, then that coheres with um, Marquis's view. Now, again, you could think that it was, is still wrong and his view may still be right, but this allows you to be, say, pro-euthanasia and still anti-abortion. So to, to underline this point, remember the difference between sufficiency and necessity. I talked about this in a previous lecture. X is sufficient for Y just when, if you have X, you have Y. Whereas necessity says X is necessary for Y just when you cannot have Y without X. So drinking, again, drinking 10 beers is sufficient for getting drunk, but not necessary for getting drunk. You could get drunk in other ways. And radioactive material is not sufficient for having a nuclear bomb, but it is necessary for having a nuclear bomb. And Mark was just saying that having a future like ours is sufficient but not necessary to having a strong right to life. Now, it is interesting that um, another advantage of Marquis's view, you might think, is that it isn't committed to saying that we don't have a right to life if we're humans, but we do have a right to life if we're persons. This may sound fine in the case of people in permanent vegetative states, but it may not sound right to you in the case of babies with their whole life ahead of them. Because obviously there's very little difference between a, babe, a fetus who's about to be born and a baby who has just been born. And if a fetus is not a person, but is a human, and if it is humanity that matters, then it's not only permissible to have an abortion, but it is also permissible to kill babies when there's some other 
you know, good reason to kill them. And some bioethicists have actually argued this, okay? And the public just, you know, freaked out on them, rightly or wrongly. But Marquis's view isn't committed to this. It's not a person-centric view either. It's not human-centric, we saw with the Spock case, but it's also not person-centric because it doesn't say that you need to be a person to matter. It's enough to matter. It is sufficient to have a, a strong right to life that you have a valuable future Okay, a future, you know, roughly as valuable as the one you and I have. Okay. So it doesn't really matter what the fetus is. The fetus could be a paper clip. Okay. And if there were some sort of paper clip, some type of paper clip that developed into humans, then that paper clip would have a future like ours and or if a paper clip developed into some sort of you know being with a rich life and so forth that paper clip would have a future like ours and it would be wrong to destroy the paper clip it doesn't matter whether it's a human or a person or whatever if that thing whatever it is has a future like ours then that thing has a strong right to life you better have a good reason to kill it marcus thinks Again, we are saying prima facie though, this could be outweighed. It, um, a, a things having a future like ours gives us a strong prima facie reason not to kill it. That is to say a reason that outweighs many reasons to do the opposite, but may nonetheless be outweighed by competing reasons. So you have a prima facie reason maybe not to lie to a loved one. But other considerations, such as saving them from killing themselves or something like that, may outweigh those reasons. And likewise, there may be uh, situations in which an abortion is permissible, like maybe to save the life of mother. So his view allows that. And as we said before, his view does not say that having a good future is necessary to the wrongness of killing. So to the objection that says, but granny's in a nursing home and she doesn't have much of a future left. Can we just go and stick a pillow over her face? No, right? He says, my view's silent on this. Maybe there are additional reasons not to kill people. And some of those reasons would apply to granny and explain why it's wrong to kill your granny. There are some rival views to why killing is wrong uh, that he would like to dismiss. One is, what we might call the sanctity view of human life, that all life is sacred. Uh, some, this view is somewhat popular in the Catholic tradition. It is difficult for someone with this sanctity of life view to be in favor of, say, euthanasia. And indeed, a lot of Catholics are against euthanasia because they hold the sanctity of life view. Marquis's view, though, doesn't have that commitment. Again, maybe... Um, euthanasia is permissible if the person wants to be euthanized or is in a permanent vegetative state. Um, why? Because maybe the, the other things that make it wrong to kill people are not present in addition to their not having a good future. But a fetus, on the other hand, does have a future like ours, so it has that reason not to be killed. Some people want to say, no, you can't have a life worth living if you do not desire to live. And that matters to this debate because obviously the embryo or fetus does not desire to live, doesn't have some sort of occurrent thought at least that, hey, I want to keep living. Uh, it may not have any thoughts in, in the early stages of gestation. But Marquis responds that, look, if you think that a desire to live is necessary to having a strong right to life, then you're going to be faced with some weird consequences, he says. So he just does reflective equilibrium on this. What about suicidal people? If you're, you know, so take, think of someone you love and they're suicidal and they don't desire to live. Is it okay to kill that person because at that moment in their despair, 
they don't desire to live. He thinks, obviously, you have the intuition that it's, it's still wrong to kill them. Uh, sometimes people are, are comatose, temporarily. A slightly different argument comes from Michael Tooley, rights protect interests. Something cannot be in your interest, though, if you cannot even desire it. So you cannot have a right to X if you cannot have a capacity to desire X. And zygotes, embryos, and fetuses cannot desire their lives. Right? They're not cognitively developed enough to desire their lives, even if their lives are in their interest, so that they therefore cannot have a right to life. And Marquis replies that we have lots of rights that we cannot desire. So for instance, a child can have an interest in being educated or not abused, even if the child isn't aware that this is in his or her interest, or even if the child isn't in the state to care about it, say, because the child is very young or mentally challenged. So premise two of this argument, Marquis says, is false. It can be in your interest to be educated, even if you cannot desire an education because you don't know what you're missing. Here's another objection. Something can't be wronged unless it can be a victim, and you can't be a victim unless you're sentient. And zygotes and maybe some embryos are not sentient. So sentient here just means the ability to feel pain, have conscious experience, okay? And when, when do we start having conscious experience in utero? I don't know. Um, it almost certainly happens in utero, but when, when is hard to say. But at least early on, plausibly, we do not. So if that's the case, then we can't be a victim. And so therefore, we can't be wronged by anything that happens to us. So therefore, we can't be, um, abortion cannot possibly be wrong on this view. And to this, Marquis argues that premise two makes a lot of sense if you're, say, thinking about plants. Can you really wrong a tree? Maybe not. Maybe, maybe we... Maybe you're not robbing the tree of anything by cutting down the tree because the tree is not sentient. But critically, the tree will never be sentient. If, there, if someone genetically engineered a type of tree that was, you know, just a tree for 50 years and then developed into an ent like tree beard, then it would be, you know, Marquis's argument would apply. You cannot chop down without some damn good reason uh, a tree that is, say, 30 years away from becoming tree beard, who's going to go on to live hundreds of years of uh, rich, sentient life. And, and I guess I have that intuition. Maybe, maybe you don't. Uh, so um, he's saying that, um, yes, even if sentient, sentientism is true, that doesn't mean that you can't wrong something that's not sentient if it has uh, a future in which it's going to be sentient. Here's another thought experiment. Imagine a lightning strike hits a swamp and out of the swamp appears a comatose, full-grown man who even though it's midnight, we'll wake up at 6 a.m. Here's another thought experiment. Imagine a lightning strike hits a swamp and creates a swamp man. And swamp man is in a comatose state until 6 a.m., right? So he's never been sentient, but he's right there and he's going to be sentient at 6 a.m. Do you think it's okay to kill swamp man? And if you have the view, no, it's wrong to kill Swamp Man, plausibly because, right, he has a future like ours or something like that, then um, even though he is not yet sentient and has, you know, never been sentient, it would still be wrong to kill him. Uh, so much like, you know, chopping down that tree, that's going to become tree beard. Here's another objection. If something's having a future like ours and makes it prima facie wrong to deprive it of its future, then it would be wrong to use contraception. Why? Well, here's a sub-argument for that premise. A sperm-egg combination has a future like ours. 
right? So some sperm and some egg got together and made you and me, right? So that sperm egg, call the sperm that made you Fred and call the egg that made you Ginger. And, you know, so Fred and Ginger are a combination. And contraception, though, keeps Fred and Ginger apart. So uh, Fred and Ginger, right, this, this thing, Fred and Ginger, do not get to um, have their future. So contraception would be wrong on this view. But contraception, this is a reductio ad absurdum, right? So if basically it's arguing that if Marquis is right, then it's wrong to use contraception, but contraception is not wrong. So by modus tollens, it must not be the case that Marquis is right. And to this, that, that is an argument by Alistair Norcross. To this, Marquis replies that this sub-argument here is, is unsound. Why? Because a sperm egg combination does not have a future like ours. Why? Because a sperm egg combination is not an actual thing, he claims. He says a sperm egg combination is just a combination of two different things, neither of which has a future like ours. You, there's no future like ours until those things um, get together to form a, a fertilized egg. And indeed, Marquis, for reasons that we won't get into, into into in this presentation um marquis doesn't even think uh fertilized eggs uh really have a future like ours uh it, you need a little bit more gestation and this has to do with some complexities around natural twinning so marquis thinks that um this sub argument is not sound although it is valid that there is no sperm egg com there's no such thing as a sperm egg combination there is no such thing as you know, your left foot and Eiffel Tower, to borrow another example from another literature in philosophy. Um, there is a, your left foot and there is an Eiffel Tower, but there is no object that is composed of your left foot and the Eiffel Tower. And likewise, there is no object composed of the egg and the um, sperm. So there is no object that has a feature like ours. So it, it, you're not wronging anything to deprive it of that feature.